Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. This video will provide an explanation of small fiber peripheral neuropathy and its current treatment. But before I begin, I think it's important to say that small fiber peripheral neuropathy is probably as poorly understood in the general medical community and recognized as it is to adequately treat when subsequently referred on to the specialist medical community. What do I mean by this? Patients often present with intractable and disabling pain and on clinical examination there is often little to see or find and so it's often underdiagnosed or takes a long time for the diagnosis to be made. Even if patients are eventually diagnosed with this condition and treated by a specialist, response rates to treatments are often less than satisfactory with patients still experiencing ongoing discomfort despite numerous medications being trialled. So let's get to grips with the symptoms. How do I know if I have this condition? The parts of the peripheral nervous system which transmit sensory signals can be divided into two main categories, the large fibre pathways and the small fibre pathways. The large fibre pathways are in reality pretty tiny and are only relatively large when compared to the small fibres. You can see my explanatory video on the large fibres and their disease processes by clicking on the information card in the corner above. The small fibres are made of two main types of nerve. Number one, the A delta fibres, which are around three to four micrometers in diameter, that's millionths of a metre, it's really tiny, and have some thin layers of myelin protective sheath around them. These transmit cold sensation and sharp pain signals. The other main group are the C fibres, which are around one micrometer in diameter and are unmyelinated and so transmit very slowly and transmit heat sensations and burning pain. Some of these also transmit itch signals and sensual touch. Unlike the large fibre neuropathies, where the disease fibres tend on the whole to stop sending their signals leading to numbness, when small fibres become diseased, they shoot off aberrant signals and leads to pain being experienced. Similar to the large fibre neuropathies, the small fibres are also most susceptible to disease processes when they are the thinnest and smallest, and so length dependent small fibre neuropathies in the feet and possibly the hand distributions are the commonest presentations. In terms of symptoms, these tend to be hypersensitivity, burning pains and allodynia, which means pain from stimuli which are not expected to cause pain. Symptoms tend to be worse when a patient is relaxing and so the classic presentation is a patient who has burning pains in the feet which are worse at night particularly as they're going to sleep and they have to remove the bed sheets off their legs to partially relieve this discomfort, that's the allodynia. Some of the small fibres also form part of the autonomic nervous system which looks after a number of systems not under conscious control such as bowel motility, blood pressure, particularly when we sit up or lie down, sweating, salivation and erectile function. Therefore, it is very important that your doctor asks you about these types of symptoms as well, both in terms of providing appropriate treatment, but also to find extra clues as to why this is happening, especially if amyloidosis is a consideration. As I mentioned before, findings on clinical examination are often pretty limited, with little to see or find just by looking at the patient. Some clues, however, can be deduced when looking at the skin quality, with some patients having dry or cracking skin from impaired sweat moisturisation. The clinician may also find impaired pinprick sensation and cold touch sensation, um, such as when placing a metallic tuning fork um, on the skin surface. So let's talk about formal tests now. The clinical story is often sufficient in of itself if the symptoms and signs are classical and no further confirmatory tests are necessary. If however the story is less certain or if the response to treatment is insufficient then formal testing may be helpful. Neurophysiologists might be asked to perform a nerve conduction test. The standard ones look at large fibre function only. If dysfunction is present, it will lend support for small fibre dysfunction too. This is on the basis that if the larger fibres are already impaired, then all the more so the small fibres will be as well as these will be more susceptible.
because of their smaller size. If these tests come back as normal, it does not negate a small fibre neuropathy. It's really important to emphasise that. Probably the most commonly used and benign technique in neurophysiology to measure small fibre function is thermal threshold testing, and this is part of the quantitative sensory tests. This involves a probe being placed on the foot or the hand, which pumps through it either cold or hot water, and the patients are asked to click on a button when they feel a change in the temperature from the baseline when it's put on their skin. The inherent issue with these tests is that it involves a number of conscious processes and so it loses a degree of objectivity. More objective extra tests are also possible. So we have the sympathetic sweat responses and this measures the body's ability to generate a sweat response to a painful impulse. If impairment is present, then the sweat response will be reduced or diminished absent. If the feet are clinically bone dry, this test in my experience is pointless as no responses will be present. The cutaneous silent period measures the degree of function of a particular pain reflex arc to inhibit voluntary muscle contraction assessing the A-delta fibres. The fewer the functioning pain fibres, the weaker the impairment of muscle contraction is. Then there are very specialised techniques. So we have laser evoke potentials or contact heat evoke potentials, which can be used to heat the skin and pick up the pain signal responses or lack of in the brain. Laser Doppler flare evaluates the skin's response to either heating the skin or injecting a small quantity of histamine and then measuring blood flow responses with a scanning laser light. Impaired areas of flare correlate with small fibre peripheral neuropathies. Perhaps the most sophisticated method involves microneurography, which is able to pick up aberrant pain signal currents being transmitted along the actual nerves themselves. This is one of the most specialised fields of clinical neurophysiology and so has only a very limited clinical footprint. Other tests include QSART testing where humidity changes in a gas passed over the skin can also evaluate the sweat response too. Finally, there is skin biopsy where a small skin tissue sample from an affected area is taken and the actual number of nerve fibre endings are counted in the epidermis. Whilst this is quite definitive, it is invasive, it can be quite difficult for patients who are already extra sensitive to pain. Before we deal with treatments on offer, we need to work out why this is occurring to offer the very best chance for successful treatment to occur as we ideally need to treat the root cause of the process rather than just try and manage pain. In contrast to the large fibre neuropathies where around 80% of causes are identifiable, small fibre neuropathy only has around 50% of underlying causes identified. Diabetes is by far the most common of causes, as is prediabetes, so if standard glucose tests are negative, then a glucose tolerance test should be the next step to look for prediabetes. You can find out more about diabetic neuropathy by clicking on the iCard above. Alcoholic neuropathy actually tends to be small fibre neuropathy and is a very important cause of this in excessive drinkers and is far more common than large fibre dysfunctions. Vitamin deficiencies such as B12 deficiency and thyroid dysfunction can easily be detected and treated by some simple blood tests. Other causes such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease, SLE, Sjogren's, Fabry's disease, hepatitis, amyloidosis, HIV, paraneoplastic syndromes and hereditary sodium channel dysfunctions are much rarer causes and should be considered in an appropriate clinical context if other tests prove to be negative. Once either a probable or a definitive diagnosis has been achieved, what are the treatment options? Clearly, if an underlying cause has been identified, this absolutely needs treating. Pain management guidelines will differ on where patients come from, and I will summarise the UK's NICE guidelines of 2013, and you can find the link below to these. Basically, the guideline divides itself into treatments for the non-specialist lead medications, starting with amitriptyline, 
duloxetine, gabapentin or pregabalin as initial treatments for neuropathic pain. If the initial response to treatment is not effective or if the side effects are not tolerated, one of the other remaining three drugs can be offered and one can consider switching again if the second or third drugs try are not effective or not tolerated. It's very important to emphasize trying each medication at the maximum permissible dose tolerable before giving up with them as it's a common cause of treatment failure is having a sub-therapeutic dose. Tramadol can be considered as an acute rescue therapy as and when needed. We can also consider capsaicin creams for patients who have very localised neuropathic pain who wish to avoid or who cannot tolerate oral treatments. Specialists have access to further treatments such as lidocaine patches or opioids etc but a holistic approach is often necessary by this point including psychological support. So I hope this video has been helpful in explaining small fibre neuropathy and its current treatments and thank you for watching.